The unsurpassed, profound, and wonderful Dharma is difficult to encounter in billions of eons, and now see it, hear it, and receive it, uphold it. I vow to fasten the Tathagata's true meaning in order to liberate all sentient <coughs> beings. Let us generate the Supreme Bodhicitta. <laughs> Yabale, <laughs> Ritaka <laughs> Liti Shantip Shantibsenhua <laughs> Uh <laughs> Tenevsanchi <laughs> 
Jundan de ki javlam go shigm sarte jundan de la lanqsim qorav shinib chuq chigdan de go denib jundan de ki shanchib sanwate tiglandir ki chib qarsato rikki vetab kechiq mang mangyot bir lung mangyot bir lung kedniki legi number mamba la murtuq bir gajam gwa yena yerjanla tsejan xiwa bshiti Liki Jibati Stava Mumber and Dushipe, Tata Kiki Jibshan Chupe, Kunnev Kurja, Kunnev Chin, Sumber Maniso. The Nibshan Chipson Hatrik Jipotet of Lagum Chabak Chik, Zarne Pimo, Sanga Salap Sixte, Jundan de Calavar de Los, Tarmo Jerne, Jundan de Landerkichi of Sorto, Dachak Kung, Tuna Ranga Sim Dobre Kijan, Liki Jibarjan. Number Mugut per Jerv Le Jerv Dachar Liki Jibab Jum, then Deji Lagber Castart of Sur Tirkichusuradon, Tirkichusuradon, Jum, then the Egyptian Jusan Chamber to the Lander Kitchi Castarto. Today we're going to begin our classes on the Sutra on generating the supreme aspiration of Bodhicitta. As I've mentioned before, this Sutra is a Sutra that encourages us to generate the aspiration of bodhicitta and to confess our previous negative karmas of uh, slandering the Dharma. Back in 1996, Ponso Grimbache had taught the uh, sutra, the Vipoya Sutra of Total Retention that we've just learned. And in 1997, at the beginning of the year, Ponso Grimbache taught on the Sutra of Medicine Buddha. After that, he gave teaching on the extensive biography of Shakyamuni Buddha, which lasted for about four or five months long. After which, we all made the aspiration of practicing the sadhana of Shakyamuni Buddha. Around the fall of that year, Pansukura Muche completed the teaching of extensive biography of Shakyamuni Buddha, and then he started giving teaching on the sutra, the sutra on generating the supreme aspiration of bodhicitta. After this teaching, he then um, traveled to mainland China, the southern part, uh, all the way from uh, Mount Eme, Chengdu, to Guilin, Nanning, Kunming, and uh, Canton, Mount Poto, as well as Mount Jitsu. Then he went back to Chengdu. So that was what happened back in 1997. Ponsu Grimbache didn't visit other places and didn't really give other teachings except the extensive biography of Shakyamuni Buddha as well as this sutra. When he was giving teachings on the, the extensive biography of Shakyamuni Buddha, I translated for everyone on the very second day, um, that was a time when we didn't have any equipment for simultaneous interpreting yet, because it was only in 1999 I went to Singapore. That's when I discovered the um, equipment and brought back those equipment and started uh, doing the uh, simultaneous interpretation. So back in 1997, uh, Ponsu Rinpoche would give teachings on the extensive biography of Shakyamuni Buddha. And then on the second day, I would translate it for everyone. After that, Ponsu Rinpoche gave teachings on the aspiration 
of generating supreme action sutra, which is this sutra, except it is a different version. How many of you were there at the time? Not many, right? It's since it's been 20 years already. Anyhow, that's that was the version, the Chinese version I used at the time was translated by Jnana Gupta back in Sui Dynasty. And the title is the Sutra of uh, the Sutra on Aspiring to Generate uh, Supreme Action. And this version that we use right now is the Sutra on Generating the Supreme Aspiration of Bodhicitta that's translated by Bodhiruchi back in Tang Dynasty. Previously, we just studied the Vipoya Sutra on total retention. After which, I noticed that majority of you started paying more attention towards your speech and uh, actions and having more right mindfulness, which is really wonderful. But I'm not sure how long it will last. I hope you can keep that right mindfulness on speech. I hope that you can review the sutra that we studied, especially the uh, Vipoya Sutra of Total Retention, to read it more and more. Because originally, you you've made the aspiration to read it or study it for over three times. Because the more you can read it and review it, you will definitely be able to remember it and implement all of those into your own action. You won't slander the others very easily. Uh, rather than nowadays, people really like to talk about other people's mistakes and don't like to talk about other people's merits. I think because as mundane beings, it's very normal to have lots of jealousy. And because of such jealousy, people don't like to talk about their uh, other people's merits and uh, the listener don't like to listen to other people's merits either. But whenever people talk about other people's shortcomings and mistakes, then they get really interested. But after studying the sutra, you should probably know talking about all of those mistakes and shortcomings of others would create lots of misdeeds for yourself. Therefore, I think it's quite important to remember to review that sutra. After the sutra of total retention, Hong Tsung Rinpoche then gave the teaching on this sutra, on the sutra of generating supreme uh, aspiration of bodhicitta. It is of the intention of to um, implement uh, a deeper uh, memory onto all of us uh, or to uh, enforce such kind of right mindfulness for all of us. Otherwise, as mundane beings, our insights would come and go just like rainbows. So it is quite important for us to uh, reinforce our right mindfulness and to try our best to stop making the misdeeds or creating any uh, that negative karma of uh, slandering the Dharma. So that's the first reason. Another reason I am giving the teaching on this sutra is because Ponsukur Rinpoche didn't really give teachings on lots of sutras in his lifetime. But then I think um, that is why I think it is quite necessary for me to spread the teachings that uh, on the sutras that were taught by Ponsukur Rinpoche when I am still alive. Um, then I can definitely give you all of uh, the um, oral transmission, which is quite necessary because it, the oral transmission mission is not very uh, common nowadays. Um, I only remember that back in 1996, uh, Master Jin Kong taught, this, taught on this sutra in Singapore for once, but I didn't really listen to his teaching and didn't watch his teaching, so I'm not quite certain. Anyhow, this sutra is not as widespread, therefore it is quite necessary to give you all this uh, teaching and uh, the oral transmission. Many people, I heard, uh, outside of Larongar, they are not very happy about not able to listen to the Dharma teachings that's given nowadays. They're not able to listen to it um, at, the, um, at the time that's given. 
simultaneously. However, I think it could be a good thing because it helps us to generate a sense of cherishing mind towards the Dharma because the Dharma is indeed very difficult to hear and it is not um, attainable at all times. So let's get into the actual sutra, the sutra on generating the supreme aspiration of bodhicitta. In fact, over here in the Tibetan language, um, over here it means to encourage uh, the ones to generate the supreme bodhicitta. Because later you will be able to see in the sutra there are 60 bodhisattvas who are uh, in fact not diligent anymore, they're uh, in the state of sloth and laziness, and this group of uh, bodhisattvas were brought in front of the Buddha by a Maitreya Bodhisattva after listening to the Dharma teaching by the Shakyamuni Buddha, then they all made aspiration to attain uh, bodhicitta and uh, uh, to be reborn in Sukhavati. So th the Buddha also gave them 20 different teachings. Over here, the sutra, in fact, is part of the Maha Ratnakuta Sutra, the Great Heap of Jewels Sutra. There are 49 chapters in total in that sutra. And this sutra, the Sutra on Generating the Supreme Aspiration of Bodhicitta, is supposedly to be the 25th chapter. It is the same for the Tibetan uh, Tripitaka and the the same for the Chinese Tripitaka. Initially, the Mahavratnakuta Sutra, according to some information in English, it says that there are over 10,000 chapters. However, before the propagation of the Maharanakuta Sutra by uh, Sangha as well as uh, Vasa, uh, Vasubandhu, a majority of them were burnt. Therefore, there are only a portion of them that's still left in this world, that is the 49 chapters. Majority of the titles for each chapters are very similar, except that there are four chapters that is currently existing in Tibetan language that's actually translated from the Chinese. So this is the history. Indeed, the Mahavratnakuta Sutra is quite a wonderful sutra. Tripitaka master from Tang Dynasty, Bodhi Ruchi, translated this, uh, translated this sutra. I'm not sure if I've introduced uh, him before, but he is just like Master Fasian. He is quite a great master. And he started, um, in fact, uh, learning all different kinds of trades and skills at, in his teenage years, such as um, different uh, uh, craftsmanship as well as um, astronomy and medicine, and he is very well learned in all those areas. When he's at age of 60, he met a master from the Theravada tradition. At first, he was debating with this master, but then he learned Buddhism and became a Buddhist and started learning Tripitaka, the uh, Buddhism uh, treaties. After five years, after learning for five years, he became a master of the Tripitaka and he was very well known, very famed. And he's well known all over the world. At that time, uh, he's already over 60. Look at Master Fasian, who uh, went abroad to study at the age of 65. Bodhiruchi also started Buddhism at the age of 65, uh, rather over the age of 60. So the Emperor Tang, Emperor of Tang Dynasty, the Tanggao Emperor, then sent people to request him to give teachings 
in China at the time. After 10 years, he arrived at the capital of Tang Dynasty, that is Luoyang. And at the time, the Emperor Tang Gao is already quite aged and then passed away. And then the only empress in Chinese history, that is uh, the Empress Wu Zetian, uh, who also invited him uh, to Luoyang. So now we can see that Budi Ruchi, in fact, was respected and well honored by many of the emperors of um, uh, the Tang Dynasty, because later on, after the Empress Wu Zetian, it was uh, her. Uh, her son, who took over, uh, who was in reign at the time, and he venerated him and requested Buddhiruchi to translate other sutras such as Avatamsaka Sutra and the Drew Cloud Sutra. All of these kinds of sutras were translated in Xi'an because then the capital was moved from Luoyang to Xi'an. Um, or rather, uh, in Chang'an, that's when Buddhiruchi translated the Great Heap of Jewels Sutra. Later, Master Xuanzang, who made the aspiration to also, tra to also translate, at the age of uh, 60 uh, of Master Xuanzang, he finished translating the Mahaprajna Paramita Sutra, as well as a portion of the translation of uh, uh, Great Heap of Jewels Sutra. Maybe at that time he was not in great uh, in great health. Master Xuanzang wasn't in great health, so he couldn't finish translating the Great Heap of Jewels Sutra, and then Bodhi Ruchi completed. Um, then Bodhi Ruchi then uh, continued with the translation. A portion of that translation was from Master Xuanzang because uh, uh, he also did a wonderful job in translation. All the officials, the government officials, the emperor at the time, the queens and the retinues of uh, the emperor uh, of the royal palace, as well as the ministers, were all supporters of uh, translation by Budi Ruchi. Also, the literatures and scholars, as well as the scholars from India, were invited to join the translation center that was built by the royal family. The emperor at the time also personally took parts, took in parts in the translation process. Later on, it was during uh, the Emperor Tang Rei, during his time, after seven years, the Heap of Jewels Sutra was then completely uh, translated. Later, um, according to the uh, to the biography of great masters of Song, uh, it says that Bodhi Rochi lived uh, lived till the age of 156. It says that on uh, one auspicious holiday, Bodhi Rochi was in the auspicious, uh, was um, uh, passed into Parinirvana in the auspicious uh, pose. He started learning the Dharma at the age of 60 and lived uh, for a long period of time, which is really wonderful. Emperor Tangxuan hosted a large uh, ceremony 
for uh, Bodhi Ruchi uh, for his uh, cremation. Around the Tanjong Emperor's time, uh, he sent his uh, daughter, the Princess Jincheng. Some said that Princess Jincheng was his daughter, and some said uh, it was uh, not his, um, not from his kin. But anyhow, Princess Jincheng, which was the mother of Chuzong Dizhen, was sent into Tibet. The two princesses that's sent into Tibet at the time Princess Jinchen and Princess Wenchen was sent uh, into Tibet. So that's how the cultu cultural uh, exchange started at the time. Anyhow, Bodhi Ruchi was definitely a great master uh, from ta uh, in Tang Dynasty, and that was the time of great cultural exchanges. He also translated uh, many different sutras. This particular sutra, as I said, that uh, Jnana Gupta also translated the sutra, and the sutra's title was Sutra on Aspiration of Pure Action. Um, Jnana Gupta was from the now India and Pakistan area, and he studied Chinese language and then came into China he passed into Parinirvana around the age of 60 or 70. He also translated many different sutras. Anyhow, the, there are different translation versions that's available in Chinese language. I really hope that if you have time, you should compare the different translations. Anyhow, the two versions of Chinese translations, there are not many uh, differences in there. This time, we're going to use the Bodhi Ruchi's version. I believe Master uh, Jing Kong also used this version. He also praised on the translation style. This sutra has the um, has two volumes, volume one and volume two. In volume one, let's look at the sutra over here. It says that, thus have I heard, once the Buddha is at the residing place of the rishis, the deer park, along with thousands of bhikshus and 500 bodhisattvas. Over here, uh, the Buddha is in the residing place of Rishi's Varanasi, which is a very important city in India still nowadays. And it was the first turning of the Dharma wheel. Uh, it was the place of where the Buddha first turned the Dharma wheel. There are lots of uh, Buddha stubas uh, over there nowadays as well. Why is it called that it's a resting or residing place of the rishis? Because the Buddha can be referred to as the great rishi as well. In the folklore of Chinese, um, in the northern, northeastern part, uh, lots of people would say that there are rishis and there are spirits. Uh, sometimes, in fact, the Buddha is referred to as the great Rishi. When the Buddha was residing over there, there are lots of Rishis who, uh, in fact, also developed the five kinds of miraculous powers were residing there because the Buddha was uh, practicing over there uh, along with those rishis. So it is a place called the residing place of the rishis. Another, another way of explaining it or another way of describing this place is called the 
a fallen place of the rishis. It says that there were 500 rishis that they were manifesting their wondrous, miraculous powers and flying through in the space. And then all of a sudden they generated some of the worldly thoughts and because of such kind of special uh, causes and conditions, while they were flying in the th- flying the space like eagles, all of a sudden their wondrous, mirac- their miraculous powers disappeared, and they all fall in this particular space. Therefore, it's called the fallen places of the rishis. In the Tibetan language, it could mean fallen. It could also mean miraculous power. There, there's a, such kind of connotation in this word. Anyhow, um, this is the place where the 500 rishis would reside and practice. Also, this is a place where the Buddhas of the three worlds, uh, the three times, turn the wheel of Dharma. It is also called the Deer Park. Um, it is the place where lots of the deers were set free and uh, it's, it could be understood as um, the life-releasing garden or life-releasing park where the deers are set free. Because in the previous times, the kings and ministers would also go hunt in the forests and kill deers and hunt for deers. Um, but there was once a, a Fandata princess who then built this park to set the deers, to liberate the life of the deers. That's the story of uh, this deer park. In Doma Monastery, in fact, there are also many different kinds of deers. They're not afraid of the monks over there. I think previously, whenever people see deers, they would feel rather quite lucky. They would feel very happy of seeing them, and people would gather and look at them. But I think nowadays, there are people who are just really bored, and they don't want to see them, and they would bother those deers. The other day, I told them that this is, in fact, very good. It's a very auspicious sign. There must be some great bodhisattvas among the uh, the monastics, because it is said that if there are deers and rabbits and the different kinds of wild animals that would surround the monks and uh, the, the the sangha, then that means that there must be some people uh, in the sangha uh, who had developed some genuine bodhicitta, and that is why, because of the compassion, the deers and animals would uh, surround them. So I think we should try to protect those wild animals. It would be very auspicious. Anyhow, over here, the Buddha was residing there along with bhikshus and 500 bodhisattvas, uh, among which in the Tibetan language, it it says that the majority of the bodhisattvas are of the high level of realization. And only a few of them have deep karmic obscurations. In Chinese language or in the Chinese translations, I think there are lots of the language that describes saying that there there are people who is of the deep karmic uh, obscuration, who is of the uh, most inferior capacity. I often hear the Chinese describing themselves as such. Sometimes I would go to Burkham, and over there people would use both both Tibetan language and the Chinese language, and they would say, oh, Mama, I've made lots of negative karma. Anyhow, among this group of bodhisattvas, some of them still had lots of negative karmic residues and lots of karmic uh, obscurations. Lots of uh, greed and anger, 
And once they have this kind of karma, they cannot control themselves. Uh, these, these are uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, the bodhisattvas are like such. They also have some ignorance. Let it be the root of faith, or the root of wisdom, or the root of diligence. Uh, they're not of the best. They are rather dull. Just like some of people over here, they would feel that they cannot remember well, they cannot practice the virtuous deeds well, but they're very good at practicing the um, vice. However, in terms of the virtuous deeds, let it be any kinds of virtuous deeds of body, speech, and mind, they do not have lots of strength. They cannot practice even for half an hour and by uh, in the sitting meditation. They cannot listen to the Dharma class for an hour. They cannot practice in diligence in chanting the mantras and chanting the sutras. But they really enjoy the, to go to the places that's full of distractions. They really like entertainments. They really like watching TV series and movies. They really like to be in those um, those chaotic and distracting places. They would feel quite in awe and really enjoy themselves in those busy places. In fact, on those streets, you would breathe in lots of dusts rather than keep your mouth open and stare into those busy intersections, it would be the best to chant mantras at home. But people nowadays are completely completely different. They really enjoy entertainment and distractions and really enjoy talking about worldly affairs. They like to talk about warfares and really like to talk about um, relationships and talk about how to protect one's loved ones and how to destroy one's foe. All these kinds of distractions are their favorite favorable uh, topics. There's another group of bodhisattvas who really enjoy sleeping. They're constantly in the stage of drowsiness. They don't feel energetic during the day, but they feel really energetic at night. When the night falls, they get very much awake. And then they would pull an all-nighter and sleep during the day. And there are people who just like to talk about random things that doesn't really have any intrinsic meanings. They would talk about all kinds of things that would encourage grasping. But if you were to ask them to look at their nature of mind and to just calm down, they're not interested in those at all. They're full of um, wrong views and uh, they're full of um, grasping towards uh, all kinds of of meaningless things in this world. And there are another group who are just interested in uh, desire and grasping. There's a group of people who um, are completely lost their right mindfulness. They would practice um, the wrong kinds of wisdom or wrong kinds of view. They would practice, for example, uh, they would grasp onto the view of permanence and bliss, self, as well as a purity of samsara. Over here in the Tibetan language, it also uh, means laziness and sloth. They would practice all kinds of confused actions, such as um, taking drugs and uh, uh, indulge in alcohol, and they would uh, they would indulge in such kind of darkness. So look at this group of bodhisattvas, the 500 bodhisattvas, a group of which 
Maybe they just generated bodhicitta at the very beginning. They're the beginners just like us who generated the bodhicitta, but because of the previous karmic uh, obscuration, they are not practicing very well, even during the time of the Buddha. So the bodhisattvas over there, in fact, they also enjoy all kinds of worldly things. Um, I think as mundane beings, when we look at this, we would feel that, oh, they're just talking about me. I like sleeping. I have negative karma. I am dull in wisdom. And I don't have lots of merits. Uh, also, I enjoy distraction. I have all of those mistakes and shortcomings. Um, so I think over here, when we look at it, uh, th this group of bodhisattvas over here, they also got all those sh shortcomings just like us. At that time, a Maitreya bodhisattva saw these groups group of bodhisattvas who uh, carries out such kind of unvirtuous actions, then a Maitreya Bodhisattva, just like us, I think we are very aware of who are the good students in a class and who are diligent in a in an institute, uh, who's very lazy in a group. It's very easy for us to see that. Uh, at the same time, a Maitreya Bodhisattva at the time he also noticed that there are bodhisattvas who um, are definitely not practicing with the diligence and who likes sleeping and uh, and not diligent and so on. Therefore, at that time, he generated a thought. And what did he think? In Tibetan language, it says jema, which means. Uh, which is a sigh. So it's a sigh out of sadness. <coughs> then he thought, Sigh, this group of bodhisattvas have already retrogressed from the path of Bodhi. Therefore, I should try my best to encourage them to generate a sense of joyful mind towards enlightenment. In fact, the name of this sutra, what did you want to say over here? In fact, the title of this sutra is to encourage the bodhisattvas to generate the supreme aspiration of bodhicitta. So, Maitreya Bodhisattva thought to himself, I should try my best to encourage all of them to generate the joyful mind to uh, attain enlightenment. And then, in the afternoon, around the time of uh, uh, around practicing, I think around 3 or 4 o'clock, at that time, uh, he was supposed to be meditating, but he couldn't hold it anymore. He was thinking that, well, I should be practicing meditation, but this is really important. So he just quickly... Uh, uh, he just quickly uh, dedicate the merit and then rush out in the afternoon. He rushed out and went to the bodhisattvas. At first, he talked with great gentleness. So he didn't scold them. He didn't say that, what did you do? Why did you do that? Rather than that, he's using very gentle language, soft and loving language to uh, speak of the Dharma to them so that they will be happy, so they will generate the mind of joyfulness. This is, in fact, very important. This is a skillful means. Of course, there are times that we can't use gentle and uh, soft words to the others, that we have to use uh, rather coarse language or harsh words um, to certain people. But you shouldn't do that right away. Uh, you should use rather gentle 
towards to begin with, to, to encourage people and to talk to people. Otherwise, if you were to start off any conversation with harsh words, it could lead to um, a fallout of the relationship. According to the Mahayana's uh, teachings, it says that there are the four magnetizing actions out of which there's the uh, language of uh, loving and kindness. You should try to use such kind of gentle language to talk to the others because it will be easier for the sentient beings to accept your language, to accept your ideas. Therefore, as a skillful, as a bodhisattva with skillful means, I think we should we should definitely adapt this kind of gentle uh, language and loving words. In the Sutra of Collection of Various Metaphors, there's a story. I believe I've told this story before. It says that there's once in a country, all the citizens in that country, they all enjoy practicing uh, the vice. So a terrible country. At that time, in that country, everyone takes it for granted that people should practice the vice. Therefore, the people over there in general, they're very coarse and rude. There was this once, the Buddha and his retinue went to the country uh, that's neighboring to this group of, uh, neighboring to this particular country. He brought 500 arhats, and the 500 arhats felt that they can also go to that country and um, benefit the group of sentient beings in that country. So Madhagalayana uh, lead a group of people to that country and uh, uh, then started giving teachings saying that you shouldn't practice in this way, you shouldn't do, uh, you shouldn't carry out the kind of actions that is uh, full of evil and deceit. And with this kind of direct language, the citizens in that country did not enjoy listening to this kind of teaching at all. So um, the citizens started to slander him and to curse him. Uh, so Madhagalayana failed in teaching the Dharma to this group of beings and uh, he returned. Then Shariputra went to that country and he started giving teachings saying that, okay, I should probably give teachings um, with uh, giving them teachings of wisdom. So the Buddha agreed and uh, Shariputra went there and started uh, giving them teachings about uh, you should first practice pre uh, by upholding precepts. And then this group of ci uh, citizens didn't want to listen at all either. So they started to um, to um, curse him as well. So Shariputra also failed. And uh, same as um, uh, the Venerable Shakya and uh, Venerable Shakyapa and uh, a group of uh, the Arhats, the great Arhats, just like the uh, Vimalakirti Sutra. Uh, so the arhats all felt that while well, this is dif very difficult to uh, teach the sentient beings in that country, then Manjushri Bodhisattva said that, okay, I can go there. I can go and teach that group of beings. So Manjushri then used a different method. Manjushri went there and started praising them. Rather than criticizing them, Manjushri uh, went there and says that, well, this is really, um, said that uh, you're really wonderful. Just like uh, there are some masters who would travel to different places and uh, they, they would first criticize by saying that, 
oh, this is really terrible. Whatever you're doing is wrong. You shouldn't do that at first. You should comply with them first. There are people who would say that, oh, you shouldn't be smoking. Um, the master is here. You, you should throw away your cigarette right away. And then the people would not listen to you at all. Rather, if you say that, well, this cigarette must, cigarette must be really good, you must feel very happy by, um, by smoking the cigarette, you must be a very happy person. If you were to address them in such a way, they would be happy. And then slowly, you can um, help them. They will be able to receive your language of um, help. Anyhow, Manjushri first went there. And he went to the king and started praising the king and went to see the citizens in that country and started praising the citizens. So everyone in that country felt Manjushri is a great person. So they started offering him flowers and wealth of gold and silver. Everyone really likes him. And then slowly, whatever Manjushri says, they would listen to him. And slowly and slowly, Slowly, Manjushri, through his uh, skillful means, uh, he tamed uh, the beings in that country. This is something that we should learn as Mahayana practitioners. I see that now you've shaved off your head and in this valley and practice very well in this valley. But once you get off from this mountain, from this remote area of practice, uh, then you see people eating meat and smoking and drinking. At that time, you, you shouldn't say that, oh, you're creating lots of negative karma. You would be falling into the Vajra hell. If you were to tell people like that, if you were to talk to people like that, you're not going to have lots of positive feedback. You're not going to be accepted by others. Rather, people would say that, well, you bald-headed shramana, what kind of what kind of qualification do you have to um, to judge me? You don't even make money to uh, to. Uh, survive in this world. You have to beg for alms. They would say things like such. Therefore, we should start off with gentle language. This is quite essential, especially in, in the propagation of the Dharma. Um, in many years of my experience, whenever I meet all kinds of government officials or people like that, uh, let them be drinking and smoking before I truly know them. I don't really stop them from all of those. There are people who would ask, can I smoke? I say, sure, but can you maybe just lower the window? Uh, just lower the window for me so I, ha I have some s uh, fresh air. And I would say, okay. Um, even if they can't, uh, I would say, okay, that's fine. Anyhow, uh, uh, I think I went, uh, I went astray from the, the sutra. Over here, it says that uh, Maitreya Bodhisattva told this group of uh, Bodhisattvas saying that noble ones, what happened that you have retrogressed from the path of the perfect enlightenment? Have you retrogressed from this path? He didn't say that, uh, what happened to you? Why did you retrogress? He didn't say it in such a way. Rather, he said in such a gentle and uh, respective way. And then the group of bodhisattvas replied by saying, all together, and replying to uh, Maitreya Bodhisattva, saying that uh, honorable uh, Maitreya Bodhisattva, we feel very much embarrassed and very much ashamed of ourselves since we have retrogressed from the path of the perfect enlightenment. We're not making progress at all. We've already uh, regressed from this path and we feel very much ashamed of ourselves. By their actions, you can see that they can, they're definitely regressed from this, uh, this path. And then they continue to say that 
Their mind, their minds are covered up by doubt. Not only they're not practicing with great diligence, they generated a sense of doubt. They're doubting that if they can receive, if they can attain the perfect uh, enlightenment, if they can uh, attain the perfect body. They started, their minds are covered up by the great doubts. So they don't even know if they can attain enlightenment. They do not understand whether they will be able to attain enlightenment or if they will be reborn in lower realms. They've already retrogressed to such a state. After generating such kind of doubt, they no longer have the capacity to practice the virtue. Rather, they're fettered by the doubts. In the Tibetan language, it is rather very straightforward. It says that because of these reasons, this group of bodhisattvas cannot generate any virtuous thoughts, any virtuous mind at all. And because of this, um, they cannot practice the virtue. There are a few different reasons that one cannot generate virtuous mind. Uh, one is because of a karmic retribution, and the other is because of um, the vice friends. Another is because of um, the environment. Uh, one more is because one cannot practice with great diligence. So there are many different reasons that could result in such. And at that time, the group of bodhisattva says that because they are fettered by doubt, they are in such kind of state of retrogression, which is really not good. They're saying that we're so ashamed. And then Maitreya Bodhisattva consoled them, saying that the noble ones, I think we can all go to see the Taragata, the perfect enlightened one, the Shakyamuni Buddha. Shakyamuni Buddha, he is omniscient. He knows the nature of all phenomena, knows the uh, multiplicity of a phenomena as well. He has the eye of wisdom and eye of Buddha. He can see all, uh, he can see everything of the past and of the future. He sees everything, and he is since he is omniscient, he doesn't have any obscuration, and he has full enlightenment. And since he has such kind of um, perfect enlightenment without any obscuration, he will be able to guide us and lead us uh, with his perfect wisdom. Also, he has perfect perfect uh, 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 perfect wisdom and a perfect um, skillful means. And therefore, with his great wisdom and great compassion, his great skillful means, he will be able to liberate all of us and he can give different teachings according to your capacity. He will definitely be able to teach accordingly. In this way, your problems will definitely be resolved. According to the Jewel of Heap Sutra, it says that um, the Buddha among the Buddha, uh, when he's in the great assembly, he can dispel doubts and confusion of everyone without um, mistake. He would use the speech of gentleness and compassion, and all sentient beings would definitely be happy to receive the teaching of the Buddha. The Buddha's speech will not disturb the mind of the sentient beings. Rather, uh, everyone would be very delighted to listen to the pleasant voice and the pleasant teaching of the Buddha. The Buddha's speech is adorned by great wisdom, just like the flower um, 
just like the um, flower uh, that's ornamented. So over here, material bodhisattva, um, lead the group of bodhisattva to the Buddha, and he's sure that the problems of the bodhisattvas will be resolved. Just like nowadays, if there are people who have lots of doubts and uh, they're fettered by problems, then there are people who would, uh, the, the practitioners, the sanghas, would take them to the great masters and uh, uh, great teachers so that they can be blessed and uh, they can listen to the Dharma teachings. And then this group of people who are fettered by their uh, afflictions can be liberated from their uh, confusion. Even by listening to a few classes of teachings in certain monasteries and centers, then their confusions can be resolved and can be fully uh, resolved. It happens in our life all the time. At the time, material bodhisattva took the 500 bodhisattvas to the Buddha. Only 60 of them have uh, great afflictions. Maybe the rest of them do not have great afflictions like such. According to the Tibetan uh, version, it doesn't really say that he took 500 bodhisattvas all to the Buddha. Rather, over here it says that um, over here it says that 500 bodhisattvas all went there, and the sixth bodhisattvas, along with uh, material bodhisattva, then prostrated to the Buddha. And they all teared up and uh, feel completely saddened. And they were all weeping. And just like nowadays, there are people who would be crying and uh, prostrating at the same time. Not sure, uh, not sure why, but it happened during the Buddha's time as well. They were crying and they were very heartbroken and uh, weeping at the same time, prostrating. Maybe they felt very much touched within the presence of uh, the, magnif the magnificent Buddha. On the other hand, as a bodhisattva, they are not diligent. They have a great uh, negative um, obscuration of uh, negative karmic obscuration, and they are fettered by their afflictions. Therefore, they feel great sadness. So at that time, um, material bodhisattva, after prostrating and uh, circumambulating the Buddha three times, then he set. Then he set back. He set back. Material Bodhisattva, he just let them cry, let the uh, Bodhisattvas cry. I remember that when my father passed away, at that time we didn't have a great telecommunication. Um, so after knowing that, I arranged, uh, the. I requested Sangha to chant for him, and then he was... Uh, he had his uh, sky burial, and then uh, so, uh, uh, he was buried. Um, then we went to Doma Monastery. My three sisters were there. My youngest sister, he was crying. She was crying, and uh, she was crying a lot. I said that, that's right, cry, keep crying. And then she paused and stopped crying. Sometimes she would complain how terrible I was at that time. She said that she was really heartbroken after knowing that uh, our father passed away. After I told her to cry, she doesn't feel like crying anymore. Because at that time I said, it was the time to cry. Father passed away, you should cry. Cry loud. And then she paused and she stopped crying. I think people are like that. When they're crying, if you were to tell them, don't cry, don't cry, and they would continue to cry. But if you tell them, 
keep crying, and then they will stop crying right away. Anyhow, uh, Maitreya Bodhisattva didn't intervene with their crying at all. Uh, he just led them to the Buddha and then uh, si- quietly sat. At the time, the Buddha told the Bodhisattvas, saying that noble men and noble women, noble women, uh, over here in the Tibetan language, it only says noble men. Did it say noble women in Tibetan language as well? Are there female Bodhisattvas? Well, according to the Tibetan version, it only says the uh, noble men. It didn't really say noble women. Anyhow, over here, the Buddha said that, well, sit up, do not cry, because crying could lead to great afflictions. Therefore, it is the best not to cry anymore. In fact, all of your current afflictions is because of your past karmic retribution, because of your past negative karmas. That is why you, you, do, you cannot practice um, or do not succeed in practice nowadays. So over there, the bodhisattvas were crying. Uh, they did not say anything about why they cried, but the Buddha knows already. He said that it is because of your past negative karmics, because of such kind of negative karmic uh, obscuration, uh, you can currently your practices um, have uh, retributes, uh, retrogressed. According to the Sutra of Right Mindfulness, um, it says that there are people who practice the negative deeds with laughter and joy. However, when it is time for them to receive the karmic retributions, they weep and cry out loud. There are people who have great happiness when they practice negative karma or negative um, um, actions, but when it is time for them to reap the fruition of such, indeed, it is quite horrifying and it could lead to great suffering. So the Buddha said over there, saying that because of your past negative karma, um, and because of the anger and uh, afflictions and uh, the uh, dualistic mind, uh, because of your past ignorance of knowing the differences of karma, you've created such kind of negative deeds. And for such reasons, you're now fettered by your past uh, negative karmas. According to the essential collection of all dharma, it says that all the dharma arise from causes and conditions. But because of one uh, not knowing the negative causes, one suffers for its uh, negative fruition. According to Master Ying Guang's collection of uh, uh, teachings, he said that the bodhisattvas fear for creating negative cause, but the mundane beings fear to reap the negative fruition. Similarly, I think nowadays people create, create negative karma uh, with great joy without really caring for its fruition. 
But when it's time to reap its fruition, uh, they suffer uh, tremendously. Nowadays, there are people who are reaping the fruition of their past negative karma. They do, they suffer from uh, ill health. And they suffer from ill mental. Um, Afflictions, and they suffer from all kinds of th- negative things that's happening in their life because of their negative, uh, their past negative karma. So, whenever we create negative karmas, uh, we should definitely uh, be very mindful of them, and we should have the right mindfulness of such. Uh, the audience sitting over here, uh, let it be practicing the deity practices, let it be the Nongju practices or Guru Yoga. When we look at the biographies of the great masters, it seems that it's very easy for them to attain insights and fruition. But when it's our turn, it seems that after practicing for days and months and even years, we do not receive any kinds of insights. We do not gain any kinds of fruition at all. But we shouldn't give up because of that, because it is because of our past negative uh, karmas, we do not receive any kinds of, um, we do not attain any kinds of um, 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 fruition, but we should practice confession so that we can pacify all of the past negative deeds so that we will be able to eventually attain fruition and uh, gain insights. Nowadays, we are living in this dark age. It is indeed quite normal that we're not able to gain any insights very easily. But we should definitely not looking for excuses. We should practice confession and we should uh, purify our past negative deeds. In this way, we will be able to progress along the path. So after the bodhisattvas hearing from the Buddha, they stopped crying and then they set up the They review their right shoulder and their left knee is uh, knelt on the ground. They they fold their hands and then talk to the Buddha, saying that um, they requested the Buddha, saying that the bodhisattvas would all want to know what kind of negative karmas we had committed in the past so that we can confess properly. Could you please tell us what kind of the thing? What kinds of things that we've committed before so that we will definitely refrain from these kinds of neg- negative deeds from now on. Just like that is taught in the Sutra of Mind Contemplation, it says that if one were to confess and make a vow of not committing those negative deeds, the three, the Buddhas of the three times would be your witness. Um, so they said that we will definitely uh, not to practice those negative deeds anymore. Could you please tell us what we've done? And then um, tomorrow we will uh, continue with uh, the sutra and learn what kind of negative deeds they've practiced in the past. Sonday <laughs> <laughs> 